Let me begin by acknowledging that we are privileged to gather today on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kwikwetlam, and Musqueam peoples. We thank them for having cared for these lands and waters since time out of mind and look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. If you know whose territory you're currently on, please take a moment to reflect on this. And if you don't know whose land you're on, I encourage you to look it up and make yourself familiar with the indigenous peoples whose land you occupy. Again, my apologies for that technical glitch. I'm not sure what happened there, but I'm happy to be back and I hope you're all on the call. Just a few house rules before I turn it over to our speaker. Um, the Q&A box is on, you have access to that. I hope you use this to type in any questions or comments you have for our speaker tonight. We have turned off the chat page just to keep it simple and keep the communications focused on the uh, Q&A box. A live transcript is turned on for your convenience if you find that helpful. And this event is being recorded and we will share the uh, recording on the Faculty of Science YouTube channel after tonight's event. All right, so tonight, as I mentioned, and as you see on your opening slide, we do have Dr. Aileen McPherson from our Department of Mathematics. I love her title, uh, presentation title. It's Who, What, Where, When, and Why? The Power of Genomics in Public Health. Here we discuss the extraordinary power and limitations of genomics for understanding disease spread and for designing effective public health interventions. So at this point, I'd like to invite Aileen to uh, screen share her presentation and turn on her, her video. Thank you so much, Aileen, and welcome. Everybody seeing my video and can hear me all right? Yep. Okay, wonderful. So uh, thank you guys for inviting me to come and talk to you. Um, if you are like me, probably the first question you're asking is, why is somebody from the Department of Mathematics coming to ask me or tell me about the genomics of public health? And so I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about what it means to be a mathematical biologist and my journey to this interdisciplinary career to begin with. Um, so I started my journey to becoming an mathematical biologist at the University of Idaho, which is in a lovely pastoral place in um, not too far from British Columbia. Um, and at this point in my life, I loved biology and I loved math, and I had a really hard time deciding which one I wanted to do. So at the beginning of my undergraduate uh, studies, I switched majors back and forth many times, kind of like picking the petals off of a daisy. And luckily, I ran into the right people at the right place at the right time, and they told me, wait, you can do both of these things at the same time. And not only can you do both of them at the same time, but it's going to be really fun. Um, so I wanted to start by polling you all and ask you, if you were to do an alternative career, or, or if you're not yet, if you do not yet have a career, what would you want to do? So in order to answer this question, you can go to this Slido link here. So you could either use the QR code or you can go to slido.com and plug in this number code here. And you should um, have access to a poll where you can uh, input your ideal career, alternative career. Ooh, some wonderful answers here. Um, I see physicist, which is going to make uh, my brother and my dad very happy. That's lovely. Um, lovely career there. Um, empower indigenous people. What a wonderful thing to aspire to. Um, lawyer. Veterinarian. More for the physicist. Um, very good. Novelist. Oh. You have a lot of courage, much more than me. That's wonderful. Ooh. 
I like the the adjective ones of these, like crafter or novelist, um, or building the community. Cartoonist. I wonder what kind of cartoons you'd like to draw. That's wonderful. Okay, well, you're welcome to continue to write your answers there, um, but I'm just going to keep talking a little bit. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about asking ourselves this question is not only do we learn something about ourselves when we decide what kind of alternative careers we'd want to do, but sometimes it's actually possible to do your current career and your alternative career at the same time, and hopefully that is what I got to do. And so um, from merging mathematics and biology, originally at the University of Idaho, I then went to the University of British Columbia for my PhD. And during my PhD, I really learned about how evolution can explain the beautiful diversity of life that we see on Earth and how math can help us understand this diversity. From there, I went to the University of Toronto, where I transitioned into thinking a lot about what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is how we can use math to help us understand disease spread. And then fortunately, I got to come here to SFU, where I'm lucky to work every day. So um, I wanted to conclude this journey with a message that I learned and I try to share with as many folks as I can, which is never be afraid to be unique, um, because not only is that uniqueness valuable, but it means that you get to do something that you love. So um, thank you for uh, sharing that journey with me. All right, um, so quick uh, alternative, uh, next poll here, which is what is your favorite popular science book, podcast, or movie? So this could be a TV show, it could be a podcast. Um, as far as popular science, the only criteria is I don't want to see a textbook. So any book that's not a textbook. Again, you can access this by going to the QR code or going to slido.com and plugging in this code. Ooh, the New York Times. Aaron Brockovich. Ooh, that's a fantastic movie. Good choice. I wonder if that's the person who wanted to be a lawyer. What a great way to join science and law. Interstellar. Short history of nearly everything. Ooh, I'm seeing the physicist trend in here. This is lovely. Quirks and Quirks. A Wrinkle in Time. What a wonderful book. And the best part is it goes across many, it's available to so many ages. That's fantastic. Ooh, Mindscape podcast. I'm a lover of podcasts and I haven't heard of this. So you guys have already given me a recommendation. Thank you. Okay, the answers have seemed to trickle down a bit. So I wanted to uh, give you my punchline. If you want to continue adding your answers to this uh, word cloud, that would be wonderful. I really actually um, really um, am thankful for your recommendations as I'm always looking for new good books. Um, so the punchline of this is that my favorite uh, popular science book is Get Well Soon by Jennifer Wright. Um, and this is a book about the plagues of history. So it walks through some of the key plagues that have defined our history as human beings. And some of them can be outlined uh, on this 
um, timeline that is not to scale. So we have everything from the Antonine Plague in 165 AD to events that you have probably read about in your everyday life, like the Spanish flu of 1918, um, to the HIV AIDS epidemic, which many of us have lived through um, the origins of, and it continues to be a public health crisis to this day, to outbreaks that occur on a regular basis, but major about outbreaks like the Ebola, um, West African Ebola outbreak in 2013, to, of course, COVID-19, or even more recently, monkeypox. And luckily, there are a lot of great um, popular science books that can teach us about these um, different events through history. So, for example, the Black Plague in Years of Wonder, um, the tuberculosis epidemic in Remedy, and just an overview of different epide um, epidemics throughout history and get well soon. So if we look at this history of plagues, one thing that we can see in this history is that the amount of data that we had and our understanding of what was going on has changed dramatically over the course of these plagues. So it wasn't until 1890 that Robert Koch um, identified that pathogens were the root cause of infectious diseases and established Koch's postulates. So um, that surprisingly not that long ago, and so before that time, um, infectious diseases were often attributed to miasma or bad smelling air. Um, and then if we jump forward some time to 1918, we have the Spanish flu. And even though they knew that it was an influenza and they knew that it was a virus, they had never found an influenza virus before and they weren't 100% sure what that virus was like or what it, how to treat it. So only in 1933 had they first um, isolate an influenza virus and that began the development of influenza vaccines. Now let's jump forward to the HIV AIDS epidemic. In this epidemic, it was the first epidemic where we actually had active testing available during the epidemic. But the epidemic started in around 1980, late 1980, early 1981, and it took four years for a viable test to be available for uh, patients with HIV. And so that's a lot of time where we were flying blind in the HIV epidemic. Now contrast that to 2013 in the West African Ebola outbreak. And in this outbreak, we was the first outbreak characterized by live genome sequencing, where we were collecting sequences of Ebola viruses nearly in real time of when patients were getting infected. And then in 2019, 2020, during the COVID-19 outbreak, um, uh, there was a period of time before Omicron took over the scene um, where there was few enough cases, but high enough amounts of genome sequencing that nearly every single case that was detected had been sequenced. So you can see that over these centuries, the amount of information that we've had at our fingertips during an epidemic has changed dramatically. And this in turn has changed how public health works. All right. So what does it mean to have genome sequences and why do we care about them in epidemics? So let's go back to before we had genome sequences and think about what data would look like in an epidemic without those sequences. So in like the pre-Ebola world, this is what your data from an epidemic would look like. You would have individuals that you detected as positive cases distributed throughout time between some point in the past and the present day. And then, um, in contrast, if you add the genomic data to this, each of those cases is now not just only a human case, but it's a viral case. So it's a case where we have the genome sequence and we can reconstruct the family tree of those viruses. And that gives us all of these genealogical connections between these cases and their history backwards in time. So the formal name for this tree is called a phylogenetic tree, um, but you can just think about it as the family tree of the viruses. All right. So the edges of these phylogenies or these family trees are measured in the number of mutations in the viral genome. So Along this edge here, for example, there might be two mutations, one little nucleotide. So a nucleotide is one of those um, pieces of a genome that is either an A, C, G, or T. 
And we've seen one A in the genome change to a G and one um, base pair in the genome that was a T change into a C. And then the cool power of viral phylogenetic trees is that these mutations occur according to a molecular clock. And this is an idea that was popularized by Jared Diamond in his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that if these mutations occur at approximately a constant rate through time, we can take the number of mutations along a branch and translate that branch into time and so that we have the full time history of the infectious disease. And so um, hence we have uh, the evolution of the infectious disease, just like Darwin envisioned with the sentinel modification. And even though I've represented viral infectious, viral phylogenies here today, um, this same concept is applied to uh, macroevolutionary organisms like whales and fishes, and that can help us understand their evolution. And if you want to learn about the evolution of um, species, you can look up this book called The Tangled Tree by David Plummer. All right, so we have not only those cases, but that evolutionary history. So what can epidemiolo epidemiologists learn from this genomic data? All right. So uh, before I go on and tell you about what we can learn from this genomic data, I want to fill in the question about why I would want to tell you about this. So reaching out to the public and talking to the public has always been a key part of public health. And this is captured in these historical um, public health ads throughout history, um, from the time of the Spanish influenza to measles to polio. And so connecting with the public has always been a really key part of our jobs as public health practitioners. Um, and I think that public health will only work better if the public understands the science under which we make these public health decisions. And so I'm really grateful that you're willing to take some time today and learn about this science so that we can have a more pu effective public health policy. All right, so the first thing that we can learn from this genomic data is when an epidemic starts. All right, so back to our case data. Remember that pre-genomes, um, this is what epidemiological data looked like. It looked like just some cases appearing throughout time. So if we were in the pre-Ebola world, we would look at these cases and we would say, when did the disease start? And we would look for this um, focal case and we would define that as epi week zero and we would count our epidemic calendar from the appearance of this first case. So if you've ever watched the movie Contagion, a lot of that movie, um, centers around finding this patient zero that defines epi week zero. But genomics add a huge power to this. So um, in contrast to this, when we have all of those viral sequences, we not only have those data points, but we have a projection of those data points into the past. And this can give us a better estimate of when the epidemic actually originated. So maybe we actually sample the first case here at epi week zero, but we know that there had to be an ancestor back here at the epidemic origin that gave rise to that epidemic. So in other words, the epidemic had to originate at the oldest ancestor or older ancestor of all of the samples that we have currently collected. So an example of this and how it's been applied is to HIV. So um, if we took the epi week zero approach, the first case of HIV was recorded in the um, weekly uh, morbidity and mortality report or MMR report in 1981. Um, but if we take the genome sequences from individuals infected with HIV in, in the United States and in Central Africa and in Haiti, and we look at their common ancestors, we can um, conclude that HIV probably spilled over into humans around 1950, and it probably came to the United States around 1969. This means that HIV was circulating in the U.S. population for approximately 12 years before we observed the first case. So that's a lot of history over which this disease was able to spread without us actually noticing it. 
So in 1981, the number of cases of HIV increased rapidly. So we started with just one case, and in a couple of weeks, we had four cases, and then 10 cases, and then 20 cases, and we saw this epidemic exponential rise in the number of cases. And that's kind of like viewing the light from a star. If you view the light from a star, you're seeing light that actually originated many, many years ago. And just like that, when we were seeing the spread of HIV in 1981, we were actually seeing transmission that had occurred many, many years before and that we could only get our hands on with this genomic approach. All right. So I'm gonna pause there and see if anybody has any questions. Um, please do ask me questions throughout. Um, I love to be interrupted with questions. Um, just a reminder to all the attendees in the room, please use the Q&A box to type your questions. We're not taking uh, raised hands for now. We would appreciate your typing your questions on the Q&A box, please. Thank you. All right, well, um, so please do ask questions throughout, um, but I'll go on to the next section, which is the next thing that we can learn, which is the who of epidemics, which is who transmitted the disease to who. So going back to our original epidemic data where we only have the cases collected through time, um, if we wanted to understand who transmitted the disease to whom in this world, that would involve what we call shoe leather epidemiology for a good reason, because it means that we would have to walk around town and survey people and give them these extensive interviews with lots and lots of questions and try to reconstruct who came into contact with whom at what time. And this is while this is a useful approach and definitely helps complement what we know from the genomic side of things, it has some limitations. So first of all, it's really easy to miss transmission events. It's e uh, easy to have an intermediate individual so that individual A transmits to individual B and individual B transmits to individual C, but A, B, and C are all within, for example, a friend group. And so it actually, you reconstruct that A transmitted to C in your interviews. So it's easy to miss this intermediate. Now, of course, some infectious diseases like COVID um, can be transmitted without individuals knowing each other and all the surveys in the world are not gonna reconstruct who transmitted the disease to who. Um, and so, it would be nice to have an approach that lets us understand these chains of transmission that is uh, separate from the interviews. And then um, not only that, but there are other infectious diseases that where individuals will know that they have a contact, for example, many sexually transmitted diseases, where interviewing people can have dramatic consequences for their lives and individuals may not actually report accurately their interactions. So, if we take a genomic approach instead, we would take all of those observed red cases here and we could reconstruct the viral history of their infections. And this will directly connect one red individual to another red individual. There can be missing gray individuals in between them, but we at least know that individual, the red individual here eventually gave rise to the red case here. And the closer the two observed cases are to one another, the more likely it is that there was a direct transmission event from individual A to individual B. So the trees of these viral sequences, they keep a history of who transmitted the disease to whom, and we can then sketch out this transmission history with that genomic epidemiology. Now, a very important caveat to this. So I'm not only going to tell you about the powers of genomic epidemiology, but also its limitations, that these transmission reconstruction events always contain amount of uncertainty to them. And the results of these inference can have dramatic consequences for individuals' lives. So for example, HIV transmission in Canada is criminalized, which means that individuals can be um, accused of sexual assault if they have uh, transmitted HIV to another person. And so this means that we have to be very, very careful with HIV data since we can reconstruct these transmission, these tentative transmission histories from this information. 
And so um, a big theme of my talk today is that we shouldn't do things that limit how people share data. Um, so it would be great if HIV was not criminalized so that we could have more open data sources. All right. So a little side note about this who transmitted disease to who, it could also be used to form clusters of transmission. So a good example of this is actually from the Vancouver downtown east side, where a lot of individuals have hepatitis C virus or HCV. And so HCV evolves really, really quickly, which means it accumulates lots of these mutations, which lets us nicely construct who infected who. And we can collect these transmission clusters and really understand the risk categories that make somebody more likely to obtain hepatitis C virus or transmit hepatitis C. Now, a note about hepatitis C virus, um, using the same genomic epidemiological approach, we've actually learned a lot about transmission of this disease. So um, it's a highly stigmatized disease, in part because it's clumped in with hepatitis A and hepatitis B, which are bloodborne and sexually transmitted diseases. Um, but it turns out that a lot of people that have hepatitis C virus actually have no idea where they actually got it. So they have this highly stigmatized disease and no idea where they contracted the infection. And so using these genomic epidemiological approaches, we could ask that question about where did these infections come from? And it turns out that they most likely came from the use of glassware in hospitals, for example, glass IV bottles. And so um, this is a note about how nobody should be stigmatized for the infectious diseases that they have, and this can prevent us from effectively treating them. All right, so I see that multiple questions have popped up, so I'm going to pause here for a second and see if I can answer any of those. Yep, let's read one of those questions. There was an article in New Scientist magazine about a mysterious and rare acquired immunodeficiency disease around 1969. Would we be able to get a much shorter time frame to identify a budding epidemic of a disease? with similar delays between infection and symptoms appearing today? Um, that is a great question. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit in a minute where I'm gonna talk about spillover events, um, actually in this next section right here. So that was a great segue, which is which animal did the disease come from? And so, yes, if we have good surveillance of animals and the animal viruses that often lead to these new emergent infectious diseases, then we should be able to detect infections or possible emergent infectious diseases before um, those cases develop into um, full full blown infections. Now, note that in the HIV epidemic, at the early years of the HIV epidemic, before we had antiretrovirals, it actually only had a three year time period between um, when individuals were first infected and when they developed AIDS. So that twelve year time span was actually not entirely because of this silent hidden transmission of asymptomatic individuals that was there was definitely individuals that had symptomatic aids um, before we had characterized it and that is much more much less likely to happen now because we're much better at going and finding those viruses and characterizing them for example it only took six days between the first observed case of covid to the time that we actually had a full genome sequence of COVID. So, you know, that took six days. So anybody who has an unknown viral infection, it, that virus is likely to be sequenced and characterized much faster now. Okay, wow, that's thank amazing. you for that question. Thank you. Um, yep. All right, so uh, that was a great segue into this next section, which is most of these infectious diseases that lead to these plagues have emerged from some animal population. Now, note not all important infectious diseases do emerge from animal pathogens. For example, smallpox has no known animal um, equivalent. There are things like cowpox, but they are not closely related enough to explain where smallpox come from. But most epidemics that we observe of originally came from some viral pop or animal population. And so one of the things that we can do with genomics is that we can sample viral cases, not just from humans, but we can sample them from bats. So this environmental sampling can help detect which type of animals um, 
gave rise to the infectious disease. So there are some really amazing books about the shoe leather epidemiology that went into tracking the zoonotic source of infectious diseases before we had genomics. But now that we have genomics, we can connect these sequences directly and we can infer which type of animal, whether it was a human or a bat, for example, had the infectious disease in the past. And we can identify these key points, these key spillover moments where it went from the bat into the human. And it also lets us know whether there was just one event, one spillover event between a bat and a human or multiple spillover events. So for example, the 2013 Ebola outbreak actually was a result of multiple simultaneous spillover events and spillover events of Ebola virus actually happen on an extremely regular basis. A fun little task is to look up Ebola outbreaks on Wikipedia and there's a whole list of all of the historical Ebola outbreaks and you would be surprised how many there are. Another fun little side note is that HIV actually spilled over into humans twice. So there's HIV-1 and HIV-2. So HIV-2 is what gave rise to what we usually think of as the HIV epidemic, but there have been multiple spillover events. Um, back to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, we can use genomic epidemiology to pinpoint not only the animal source, but the location of that animal source. So by using a time series of human patients of where the humans first were detected with Ebola, um, some genomic epidemiologists not only track down the animal source, but the exact tree in which the bats were roosting that gave rise to the major component of the 2013 West Africa Ebola outbreak. Um, and now another little note about this is that it's actually really hard to know if you're not missing an intermediate host between, for example, that bat and the human population. And this explains a lot of this conversation about the uncertain origins of COVID-19. So we know that bats have a coronavirus. We know that pangolins, which kind of look like a little ant eater, have coronavirus. But we don't know if there's an intermediate host between that pangolin and human. So maybe it was something like a raccoon dog. Maybe it was the pangolins themselves, but just not a pangolin that we have currently sequenced. And so there will always be a bit of uncertainty about what animal host gave rise to an epidemic. But this type of approach can be extremely helpful in narrowing down the possibilities. All right. Um, any questions before I go on to the next section. Yes, there's one question that's related to just uh, what you just recently said. Why do animals cause diseases, actually? Um, so animals of all types, so us and all types of animals are really, really good at sharing infectious diseases. So we give infections to animals, animals give infections to us, animals give infections to one another. For example, COVID can be carried by mink and by deer. Um, so that's a situation where humans actually most likely gave the infection to animals. And so it just turns out that our immune systems of animals are not different enough that there can be a lot of sharing of infectious diseases between us. Um, fantastic you. question. All right. And, and, and next... sorry, going yeah. back to uh, your discussion about HIV, there's a question here about that. So if a person had HIV in 1971, would their symptoms differ from 1990? So that's a little bit of a hard thing to answer. So at some level, their symptoms would not differ. They would have a drop in white blood cell count. Now, what we observe as their symptoms, which are these downstream infections like cryptococcus, pneumonia, or um, carposi sarcoma, and all of these downstream consequences um, likely would have differed because of different possible exposures and interactions between people. So it might look like they have different different symptoms, but the underlying symptom of a loss of your immune system would be the same in 1970 versus 1990. Um, of course, in 1990, when we had antiretrovirals, we had a way of managing the loss of white blood cells where we didn't have that in 1970. 
Thank you. Okay. I'll Thank stop you. there for now. Yeah, that's great. So the next thing that we can learn from genomic epidemiology is the where. So where did an epidemic originate? Um, and so I have a quick question for you guys, which is um, a guess of where you think the tw uh, 1918 flu started. So again, you can access this poll by going to Slido using the QR code or going to the link and, and using the numerical code. Oh, I love you guys. Not Spain. Spain, France, Europe, England. Oh, very good intuition. 1918, First World War. Maybe somewhere in Europe? The United States, Canada. Venezuela? Oh, lovely. Good. We got some South America in there. USA? Okay, I think the answers are trickling off here, and I think we got a pretty global representation of this. And so your guys' intuition is perfect. So you might have thought that it was in Spain because it is often called the Spanish influenza, but it turns out that our best guess of the origins of the 1918 flu are actually from Kansas. Um, now you might ask, how did an infectious disease that emerged in Kansas get named the Spanish influenza or the Spanish flu? Um, and it turns out that your intuition about World War I was completely right. So it turns out that there was a lot of rules about what uh, different countries could publish in their newspaper um, because there was all these moralities acts at that time. And so only Spain was neutral in World War I. And so they were the only country that talked about the flu and how many cases of the flu that they were um, getting. And so hence it became known as the Spanish influenza. And so I want you to keep the story in mind as I go through the next couple slides. Uh, great guesses, everyone. All right. So just like we can figure out what animal an infectious disease came from. I could just take those animals and replace them with countries and we would have an idea of where an infectious disease was transmitted from. So for example, the spillover of Spanish flu from North America into Europe during World War I. Now, this method of constructing the movement of an infectious disease can be used outside of the context of infectious disease. And I highly recommend looking at the CBC podcast by, um, featuring Kaylee Byers, who is a local scientist who used the same method to understand the movement of rats through Vancouver and understand how rats occupy the Vancouver downtown um, and whether they move or not move. And this in turn can understand how uh, vectors or animals that transmit infectious diseases like rats um, can contribute to the movement of infectious disease. All right, so a key note about this, a key warning is that this kind of inference can be strongly biased toward countries that report the data. So we just saw this in the case of the Spanish flu, that the Spanish flu got attributed to Spain because they were the only country that provided the data of how many individuals were getting sick. And this thing, same thing plays out in the genomic world as in the non-genomic world. So a situ one example of this is when we would talk about like the South African variant or the Indian variant or the Italian variant of COVID-19, that we actually do not know if those variants actually arose in those countries, but we know that they were first reported in those countries. Now, reporting an infectious disease is a wonderful thing to do. Please, countries need to share their data. That's lovely. 
but it can come with huge consequences like having a variant of concern named after you. And so when we make these bad decisions like naming a variant after a geographic region, it can penalize people from sharing their data, which is not good. So beware of that. All right. So we already saw an example of this applied to an infectious disease where we have um, the spread of HIV from Central Africa to Haiti and from Haiti to both Trinidad and Tobago and to the US. And so using this inferential approach, we can understand the geographic movement of HIV. Another fun example that I like is the spread of Zika virus throughout South and Central America. And there were lots of questions at the time about how the FIFA World Cup contributed to the spread of Zika. And so they could actually reconstruct how it spread through these different countries and the movement of individuals to Brazil for the World Cup and conclude that while the spread of, infect of Zika was at the same time as the FIFA World Cup and that certainly having the FIFA World Cup probably made the epidemic worse, it did not contribute to the geographic spread of the infectious disease. All right, so another thing that we can learn is how fast an epidemic is spreading. And so um, how we can do this is we can go back and look at that structure of that tree and we can say, Every time that you have a split in the tree, so every time you go from a single line to two different lines, with this only happens when one viral lineage becomes two viral lineages, which happens when one individual transmits the disease to another individual. So every time you see a little split in this tree, I want you to think, ah, a transmission event happened. So for example, we had a transmission event here and here and here, and here and here. The wonderful thing about this is that depending on how many splits in the tree we have, we can intuit that a particular infectious disease is spreading slowly or spreading really rapidly. So for example, the one here on the left has very few splits and there, hence is spreading slowly, and the one on the right has many splits and hence is spreading fast. A cool example of how this has been applied to the uh, to infectious diseases is in the case of the Tasmanian uh, facial tumor disease, which is actually a transmissible cancer and has some really cool immunology behind it. Um, but it was first detected in 1998. Um, and this is a huge conservation concern in these animals because this facial tumor disease um, starts out not being super severe and gets worse and worse and worse and eventually kills the Tasmanian devil. Um, and so it was wiping out lots of the Tasmanian devil population. And so we could use the genomics of these facial tumors to reconstruct how fast this epidemic was spreading throughout Tasmania. And we see that at the point in time when we first detected it, there was a rapid increase in the incidence of that facial tumor, but fortunately it has recently leveled off. And luckily there are a few resistant Tasmanian devils who do not get the facial tumor, um, who will likely be able to rescue this population from this infection and prevent the population from going extinct. All right, I'm gonna pause there and ask if there's a question that I can answer quick. I'm going to go back to the who infected who question. There's some someone in the audience would like to know before we ask who, don't we need to know how, such as air transmission or contact transmission? Ah, yeah, your intuition is very good. Hear that these two ideas are very tightly linked to one another. So one way of understanding uh, who infected who is to understand how the disease is transmitted. For example, if it's bloodborne or uh, aerosol borne, um, and that would be a really critical in piece of information in this pre-genomic world where we would have to design interview questions that would have targeted um, those kind of connections. But in a genomic world, we don't necessarily need to know that first. So we could actually ask who got the disease from whom and then and then dig into how those individuals interacted and that can give us information on likely routes of transmission. 
Um, and so this is actually played out in our understanding of transmission of COVID and the and the role of different protective measures. Thank you. So I'll leave the who question and I'll move to the uh, where question. Someone wants to know, would you know where COVID originated? Uh, um, so I'm gonna leave that question aside. I think that's a very interesting question um, and uh, a very important one. Um, it is something that there are a lot of very smart scientists that are talking about it and there's a lot of discussion about it. And so I kind of don't want to touch that question with a 10 foot pole um, because there are a lot of people that are far more qualified than me to answer it. Um, and I wouldn't want to give out incorrect information. But uh, so yes, it's being studied. We can use these approaches to study it. Um, uh, but I'm going to divert on that question. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I'll end with this for this for now you mentioned a podcast earlier could you go back to that slide someone's interested in finding out the name of the podcast that you referred to earlier i think it was in your previous slide yes um this, this one. one i think yeah yeah uh so the name of the episode is rat city um i don't know which cbc podcast it's on but it's rat city all right uh, thank you. And hopefully, I think this is recorded, this presentation is recorded. And so all of these little notes about public um, science books should be available with mm -hmm. that video. Thank you. Okay. So we can study how fast an infectious disease spreads. And using similar methods, we can ask what are um, variants of concern? So what mutations cause a, a disease to change how it's spreading and um, how do we detect that. So when we talk about variant of concern, we're looking for these critical mutations that occur that all of a sudden change the rate at which an infectious disease is spreading. So imagine that you have the orange infectious disease here that's spreading at kind of a medium rate, some branching events here, some splits in this tree, but not super many. And at some point in time, there's a mutation from A to G, this critical mutation, and all of a sudden you have a burst of infection events. So it's signals like this in the COVID phylogenetic tree that we use to define variants of concern. And then we would follow what would happen with those variants of concern through time to see if that transmission of that increased rate of spread would play out over longer periods of time. An important note is often there's not just one little mutation here, there's often many mutations that occur. And this can uh, um, be a sign of uh, how and who was carrying this infection that allowed that variant of concern to emerge. Um, so for example, we see this with the Omicron variant of concern where you have this baseline rate at which mutations are accumulating. So here on the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have the number of mutations. So the dots that you see here in this gray green blob down here are that molecular clock. You have this slow and steady accumulations of mutations through time. And then you have this weird red line that just shoots out of nowhere, has a ton of mutations, and that is Omicron. And it leads to this really long branch in the phylogenetic tree. And then we can see that in we have this gray green blob over here, and they have these really long branches in the phylogenetic tree, which is characteristic of this slow and steady splitting. And then if we look at the Omicron tree, it's like a little teeny, teeny brush. There's just splits all over the place. So you can see that there was a slow spreading variant and then the rapid emergence of this rapidly spreading variant. So by looking at the length of this branch here that led to um, Omicron variant, we kind of can intuit that something unusual happened that allowed Omicron to emerge. So there are lots of different possible hypotheses for it, and there's a great public, um, public science article about it from Nature given here. Um, but there are some hypotheses like possibly that COVID went from a human to an animal, mutated a bunch in the animal, and then came back into humans. Or possibly this variant of likely emerged in sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, 
there is a lot of coincidence of SARS-CoV-2 and HIV in this region, and individuals with HIV have a suppressed immune system like we've been talking about, and this lets there be lots of viruses in their body and lets those viruses evolve like crazy and accumulate mutations like crazy, and so possibly an immunocompromised patient um, gave rise to this long branch. And so the little note that I want to note here is that epidemics are not independent objects. Our ability to control one epidemic will have consequences down the line for our ability to control another epidemic. And so I do not want you to take away from this that it was anybody's fault for there being a, the emergence of Omicron. Um, somebody getting infected with an infectious disease, it's no one's fault. But how we control one epidemic will impact how the dynamics of another epidemic occur. All right, so a fun Sorry, little can slide. we go back? Sorry, can we go back to that yep. previous slide? Um, someone's curious to find out what causes these critical mutations to occur. And second question is, um, you you mentioned the molecular clock. Is it possible to forecast an upcoming infectious disease before it actually before it even happens? Yeah, so um, when so all of these accumulation of mutations, mutations are blind to the future. And so this is what we think of when we talk about randomness in evolution, is what mutations occur are random with respect to how they will behave in the future. So no, it is not possible to predict what mutations will arise and how they will perform in the future um, from an evolutionary standpoint. We can do cool little things where we induce mutations and viruses and then study in a lab how they interact with human cells. And we had actually done this with Omicron before the Omicron variant emerged. So we knew that there were mutations in those genes that were really important for binding that were actually very much like Omicron. Um, but with this molecular clock, this is just the slow and steady background accumulation of mutations, and we can't predict what the effect of any one of those mutations would be. Mm -hmm. Maybe related to what you had just said, someone's interested to find out uh, how will AI or how can AI be used to forecast these diseases? Ooh. I mean, there's a lot about protein structure. So every time a mutation occurs in the DNA, it the DNA gets coded into a protein and then those proteins are folded. And so AI might be able to be used to understand folding. Um, and certainly there's a lot of uh, data out there that we can use, for example, um, the distribution of mutations across the genome of viruses to to maybe predict where mutations will occur using AI, um, but this is not my area of expertise. So um, those are some of the things that first come to mind, but I'm gonna digress on the rest of that. Fair enough, thank you. Awesome. All right, so a cool little note about this is that how these branches occur in, in, tree, uh, in the trees of different types of viruses look different. So if you look at that COVID tree, it's very bushy. It spreads out on the left and it spreads out on the right and it's very bushy. Now contrast this with um, influenza. So here are two different types of influenza, H1N1 and H3N2. And for both of these influenza infections, we see that the, the, the tree tilts to one side. So it spreads out on one side rather than spreading out symmetrically. And so when we see this spread out to one side, it kind of looks like a staircase, so we call it a ladder-like tree. And this kind of ladder-like tree often emerges when um, we have a virus that is evolving to evade human herd immunity. And so by looking at this shape of this uh, phylogeny, we can then use that to predict where the next um, virus is going to be, and this can help us design vaccines. So actually going back to that question about AI, questions like this, like vaccine design and how we can use phylogenies to predict the next uh, emerging variant um, could be a use of AI. All right, 
So um, I have gone through a lot of material today, so thank you for sticking with me. So I wanted to give you a summary of what we did today. So we talked about how we can go from having these dots, which are the cases of an infectious disease, to a phylogeny, which is this family tree of those infectious diseases, and how that can contribute to our understanding of who, what, where, when, why, and how, and which infectious diseases um, of how infectious diseases spread. Um, rather than going through all these questions again, I really wanted to share with you my challenge to you, which is to take the slide. So if you need to screen, um, screen clip it, please do that. And I want to challenge you to share what you learned today. So just like infectious diseases can be transmitted, our knowledge can be transmitted when we share it, and only when we share our knowledge can we have effective public health strategies. So with that, um, I know there are lots of questions out there, and hopefully all of you have found one little um, science book that you will find interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes, there are tons of questions I see in the Q&A box, and I'll try my best to, to read everything. Um, I'll start with this uh, first question I see. Uh, this question has to do with susceptibility related to genomic differences in an individual rather than a virus. Are there strategies in place to capture susceptibility related to host difference as opposed to viral differences? Um, okay, so there's lots of answers to this question. So um, in fact, the whole idea of looking at human genetics and using that to understand how individuals respond to infectious diseases, this is the core of the field of personalized medicine and is the effort of lots of individuals. Um, actually, there is a researcher at SFU, Lloyd Elliott, who has looked at human genomes and try to understand what mutations or what variation in human genomes make individuals more or less susceptible. Now, an important note is that human genomes come with a lot of risk. So they are a huge privacy concern. And so we have to be really careful with that data. So we have lots of available virus data, but we don't actually have a lot of available human data. And so while we can learn these things from human data, um, it comes with a lot of ethical concerns. So we have to be careful with how we use them. Thank you. Speaking of genomes, another question here is, are the viral genomes collected from two infected people, are they exactly the same? Yes, so this can happen. And it is more likely to happen with some types of viruses that mutate really slowly. So coronavirus doesn't mutate all that fast. So we definitely sample viruses from two different individuals that look identical to one another. Now, take HIV. HIV doesn't mutate all that much faster, but it takes so much longer from individual A to transmit to individual B that we often see many, many, many mutational differences between individual A and individual B. And there are lots of different types of viruses. There are RNA viruses, DNA viruses, double-stranded viruses, single-stranded viruses, and all of these features will determine how fast these mutations accumulate and the rate at which this molecular clock is ticking. And so mm -hmm. all of those things will come into play to determine whether individual A's virus looks different from individual B's virus. Mm -hmm. Next question is, how do viruses mutate and why do they mutate? Ah, so viruses have a live fast and die young strategy. So um, they just want to make as many copies of themselves as they possibly can. And this means that they're not very good at proofreading. So we actually call this proofreading. So you have this sequence of letters, which is your genome, and it gets copied into a new sequence of letters, which is the offspring genome. And it happens so fast that they often make mistakes. Now, us as humans, we spend a lot of time editing our genomes and proofreading them so that we don't make mistakes, because when we do make mistakes, it can lead to things like cancer. So that's not very good. But viruses, they're like, eh, I don't care, I'll just make another copy. So they don't take a lot of effort to proofread their genomes, and so we get a lot of mutations in the genome. Perfect, thank you. Let's go back to the 
how fast question. And you were mentioning something about splitting in the tree. What factors cause those splits in the tree? Okay. So if you look at those lines that I had in the phylogenetic tree, actually each one of those re lines represents a population of viruses, not a single virus, but a population of viruses. And so if I have COVID, I have a population of viruses within me. But if I transmit COVID to you, I'm giving you a tiny, tiny sample of the population that I have, and I'm giving it to you. Now, we have two separate populations that no longer mix, and they no longer get mixed together. And so that leads to having this split in the tree where one population becomes two. Perfect. That's very helpful. Thank you. This is an interesting question. How do immunologists fit into this picture since the topic you discussed is an arms race between the virus and the human immune system? So where does immunology come in? Oh, um, the field of immunology is going through a revolution right now. So one thing that I didn't talk about today is that we can actually sequence individual cells. So we don't need a whole bunch of cells to like crush together and extract their DNA, which is what we needed only a short amount of time ago. Now we can actually sequence the genome from an individual little cell. And one really cool thing about this is we can sequence individual immune cells and those genomes that give rise to the antibodies that protect us from infectious disease. So immunology is going through this revolution right now where suddenly they have this way of actually tracking how antibodies um, are created mm -hmm. and how antibodies vary from one another. So you're totally right that there's a key interaction here between immunology and, mm -hmm. and um, public health. And part of what's going to happen in the next 10 years, I hope, is that the single cell sequencing will revolutionize this connection. Thank you. Next question is, how can this research, this kind of information, help people develop vaccines? Ooh. Um, so we talked about variants of concern. So if we have a mutation or set of mutations that suddenly changes how an infectious disease evolves uh, or spreads through a population, um, one reason for that change in that spread could be because it's evading the human immune response. And so if we intuit that an, a variant of concern is spreading because suddenly individuals that were previously immune to the infectious disease are now no longer immune to it, it can be a reason to say, ah, we need a new uh, vaccine to that new variant. And actually, we've seen this play out over um, time in COVID. Thank you. Next question. What is a variant of concern? What if a virus mutates a lot? How, ca how can you even tell that it's still a COVID virus? Ooh. Okay. So I'm going to unpack that. So I think the name variant of concern was very well named. So it's a variant, which means that there are mutations between what we had before as the virus and the virus that we have now. So it's a variable of all that virus. And it's of concern. This doesn't mean that it is guaranteed to spread more quickly, but it means that we should keep an eye on it. So um, that is what defines a variant of concern, is anything that scientists flag as a potential um, mutation of a virus that just looks different. Um, and then to go into the other part of the question is, um, uh, sorry, I suddenly forgot that part of the question. What was the other part of the question? What if a virus mutates a lot? How can <laughs> you tell it's still a COVID virus? Okay, thank you. Um, yes. All right. So one of my favorite examples of this is hepatitis C virus. So there are actually seven different subtypes of hepatitis C viruses. And these different subtypes differ by over 95% of their genome. So you're like, look at that. And you're like, how do we know that this subtype is also an HCV virus and this subtype is an HCV virus, given that 95% of their genome is made up of different letters? But it turns out that there are key letters that make HCV HCV and give you the symptoms of HCV. And so we can look at those key spots in the genome and know that it's still an HCV virus. 
Thank you. Next question. If we only give people a sample of our infection, does that mean that you can get someone in your household sick and then they can get you sick again later from the same infection? Um, so that really depends on how our immune response occurs when we get sick. So some individuals mount immune responses that lead to long-term immunity. And then sometimes when you get sick, depending on who you are and at what time you got sick and how you got sick, you might mount an immune response that doesn't give you long-term immunity. So in the case when you don't amount a neutralizing immune response, you can actually get infected again. So you could have this circular household transmission, um, but that actually doesn't happen all that often. Thank you. Next question, can you speak about some tangible benefits to our increased skill with data genomics with respect to COVID-19? Yeah, um, so variants of concern can be like one of the top things that we have learned. So um, in real time, we could tell public health agencies, given the genomic signals that we were having, we're like, oh, watch out for this, watch out for this. And you might need to change how you're, uh, what public health measures you're using, because we all of a sudden see a new variant that is spreading rapidly. So for example, with Omicron, we had detected that there was a new variant that was spreading rapidly long before we actually saw those consequences of that spread on a population-wide level that we would have to use in order to make those public health decisions. So that early detection of those variants of concern is a major piece of it. Mm -hmm. Something uh, related to that, someone who just got COVID, she says, I just got over COVID. I think I know where I got it and I reported it to the group. But if others don't report it, I'll never know for sure. So this is somehow related to what you're explaining earlier, the who infects who and how we report these things. Yeah. So any comment on this? Yeah, so um, Thank you for telling your friends that they may have been exposed. That's always a really important thing to do so that everybody can take precautions like wearing masks if they need to. Yeah. Um, but a side note on this is one of the key things about science is talking about uncertainty. So you mentioned this in your question that you think you probably know where you got the infection mm -hmm. from, but there's always this chance that you got it when you were in a cafe drinking coffee. Right. right? So um, I think understanding that there is this uncertainty and separating that uncertainty from individual behavior is really important and recognizing that different people have different responses to that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's very, very responsible, actually. Going back to animals, which animal is the disease from? Are all or most new pathogens from bats? Ah, yes. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we're really good at giving diseases to animals and animals are really good at giving diseases to us. So I highly recommend checking out the book Spillover um, and it talks about the sources, the animal sources of lots of different human pathogens. And sometimes they're, they're bats, they could be horses like West Nile virus, or they could be rats like Yersinia pestis that caused the Black Plague. And so, yes, lots of different animals give us infectious diseases. There are some animals like bats that, that because of how they interact with their ecosystem and how they live relative to humans that lead to lots of spillover events. So it definitely is that some animals are more likely to transmit diseases than others, um, but it's, it's a complicated question. There are a lot of animal sources of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. You talked earlier about using genomic data in determining the origin of an epidemic. Can you also use this same information to possibly predict the end of an epidemic? Mm. Um, that's a little bit more challenging because kind of one of the definitions of an end of an epidemic is the fact that there would be no more sequences left anymore. And so, um, yes, you can kind of predict the end of it in that you didn't have any samples left. Um, now, there's a different way of thinking about this. 
So I talked about talking, um, understanding how fast an infectious disease is spreading. So take those Tasmanian facial tumor diseases. We can see that it was spreading super rapidly and then kind of leveled off. So if you want to talk about the end of an epidemic as the slowdown or leveling off, of transmission, and so this is the example of an endemic infection, that could be the idea of, of um, the end of an epidemic. Thank you. I'm going to ask this last question more for the benefit of high school students who might be in the room tonight. We know that you're from the Department of Mathematics, but you have not spoken much about mathematics. What type of math is most important in your field, particularly in this research. And for the high school students in the room, can you talk a bit more about how to apply this math in several other fields be besides healthcare? Oh, 100%. Okay, so what one of the key things that we talked about today was this: these occurrences of mutations. So the occurrence of mutations is random. And so the math word for random is stochastic. So the type of math that you use to understand this is the field of stochastic processes. So the evolution of viruses along these phylogenetic trees is a complex stochastic process. And so I use that a lot. Um, now, I also use it to study evolution in non-infectious disease scenarios. Um, so inherently, um, evolution is random. There is a key part of evolution that is called genetic drift, which is by definition the randomness of evolution. And so I use stochastic processes to study the evolution of fungi, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yes, I use it all the time. Thank you so much. This was a amazing discussion and I'd like to thank you so much Aileen for your time tonight and I specifically want to thank everyone in the attendee room for typing in all those questions and all your comments there are lots of comments about all the thank yous this is an excellent presentation thank you for your research so I appreciate everyone typing in their comments and uh, questions uh, for Aileen um, before I end I just wanted to promote our next event. It's happening on November 27th. We did invite someone uh, from our uh, molecular biology group. He's an indigenous faculty research uh, member, just newly joined the, the faculty. And he'll be talking about indigenous ways of knowing and a two-eyed seeing approach as this relates to his research on CO2. I hope you can join us then, November 27th because you're all part of our mailing list, you will receive the Eventbrite link for this event. I hope you can join us on the 27th. Also on Zoom webinar format at the same time on the 27th. All right, thank you so much, Aileen, for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure having you for Cafe Scientific. I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, event. I also wanted to thank uh, uh, a fr uh, some of our friends from our MEX web team who joined us tonight, they, you don't see them, but they're at the back end of supporting us uh, technically for this event. So again, my name is Cynthia Hansen from Simon Fraser University's Faculty of Science. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see you on November 27th for the next cafe. Again, take care everyone and have a good evening. <music>